From toys to movies and even trading cards, you name it and Pokemon's on it. With 7 main games, numerous remakes and spin-offs and a whole new main game coming later in the year, it's hard to deny the franchise's popularity with children and adults alike. Heck, just look at the phenomenon that was Pokemon Go. I haven't seen a game bring gamers and non-gamers together quite like that. Granted, that app was more of an experience than a full-fledged game, the impact it had on gamers and non-gamers alike was unbelievable. And basically, this is what's going on right now. There are maybe a thousand people playing the game. With a peer like that, it's no surprise that the series is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And what better way to commemorate this special occasion than with a mini retrospective? I'd love to cover all the games in the series, but that would take forever, so instead I'll be talking about Pokemon Red, Gold, and Silver. So how did Pokemon become the gaming juggernaut it is now? To answer that question, we need to go back in time. Back to a simpler time. A time when a young boy could go out and catch bugs in a forest or by the river. Born in 1965, series creator Satoshi Tajiri grew up in a rural suburb in western Tokyo. As a child born in the post-Godzilla era, he was fascinated by and took a keen interest in manga, anime, and most importantly, bugs. He would often observe bugs and take them home with him to learn more about them. His obsession with bugs would earn him the title of Dr. Bug amongst his friends. As time passed, however, his interest in bugs would fade as a result of urban development. Less natural growth meant less bugs to find as a result, and a lot of children started to play indoors instead, including young Tajiri. His other interests were still intact, and he was a big fan of Ultra 7, a show that featured a protagonist that would use capsules to summon monsters to fight for him. Sound familiar? Tajiri's interest in anime was so great that if it had not been for video games, it would have been likely that he would have gone into producing anime instead. In 1978, a little game called Space Invaders was released. It had a simple concept, defend yourself against a wave of incoming aliens by blasting them out of the sky. You're given four barriers to protect yourself, and the game becomes progressively harder. If you got hit by the alien's laser and lose all your ships, then it's game over. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this was the game that Tajiri was obsessed with in his teenage years, and the game that inspired him to become a game developer. As this was a time before the internet, oh, the glorious, wonderful internet, Tajiri noticed that there was a lack of games coverage in the media. He decided to take things into his own hands by creating his own gaming magazine called Game Freak. He, along with Ken Sugimori, would create a magazine focused on giving hints and tips about games such as Donkey Kong. Tajiri would handwrite the magazine, while Sugimori would handle the illustration side. The magazine sold quite well, and as more copies were being sold, they moved from photocopying issues to using a printer instead. Because of the magazine's success, by the age of 18, Tajiri had his own business going, and as he became more experienced, he realized that most games weren't that good. Quoting Tajiri from an interview, The more I learned about games, the more frustrated I became because the games weren't very good. I could tell a good game from a bad game. My conclusion was, let's make our own games. And just like that, in 1989, Game Freak went from being a magazine publisher to a video game development company. Meanwhile, Nintendo had just released their second handheld console, the Game Boy. Upon seeing the new console, Tajiri became interested in the Link Cable's ability to connect players. At the time, many games used communication as a way for players to compete, such as Tetris's Battle Mode or an Arcade Racer. Tajiri wanted to make a game that would let people interact in a friendly way. Recalling hobbies from his childhood, he soon realized that his childhood experiences could be rolled into one concept. He envisioned a game where people could go and collect creatures and store them in capsules like the one from Ultra 7, a clever amalgamation of his bug catching hobby and the show he enjoyed when he was younger. Planning for Pokemon started in 1990 with Tajiri as the director. The first thing I want to talk about is the name. Originally, the game was going to be called Capsule Monsters, but trademark issues meant they had to change the name. They tried Capimon, but that name didn't feel right, so instead they went with Pokemon, a portmanteau of Pocket and Monsters. The name stuck, and now it was on to fleshing out the concept itself. Tajiri was fixated on the link cable and visualized organisms being able to travel on it. And with both packs, you can catch them all. This led him to the concept of trading between players and became the central idea for the game. Quoting from producer Sunikazu Ishihara, 
while Game Freak focused on was creating fun gimmicks like how to make trading more interesting. So it's clear from the beginning that they wanted to focus on player interaction, but what kind of gameplay did they want? Action or RPG? In Japan, the RPG genre was more popular than the action-oriented games. This was probably because of the fact that arcade machines were much costlier to operate in Japan than in America. As a result, people in Japan became fascinated by RPGs, games you bought once and could get lots of playing time out of, and this is the direction Game Freak wanted to take the game. The story of the game was initially going to be more like a traditional RPG, where our hero fights an evil villain, but they thought a story about a boy completing their Pokédex would be more appropriate. This happened while they were writing Pokédex entries, and because they didn't want to make the traditional RPG story in the first place, the idea stuck. Now that we've talked about the core concept and the genre, let's talk about the creatures themselves. The team originally created 200 Pokemon, and many of the earlier Pokemon had dinosaur-like designs. This was because Pokemon types hadn't been thought of yet, but we'll talk about that later on. The devs initially wanted people and Pokemon to have an owner-pet relationship, but that quickly changed as they experimented with the idea of them being friends instead. I don't really understand how that concept works, because if people and Pokemon were friends, then why do Pokemon have to do battle for pocket money? The friendship theme was something the devs really wanted to emphasize, to the point where when it came down to deciding whether players should be able to have 3 save slots, or be able to nickname their Pokemon, well, everyone picked the nicknames. The game was finally released as Pokemon Red and Pokemon Green in February of 1996 six years after development started. Part of the reason why it took so long was because there were only four programmers. As a result, some people had to take on multiple roles, like the game's composer Junichi Masuda, who also worked on programming. The games weren't always going to be split into two versions, for that we have Shigeru Miyamoto to thank. These two versions would have the same story but contain exclusive Pokemon that you couldn't catch in the other version. Miyamoto thought that by splitting the games, it would encourage players to interact with each other and emphasize the communication aspect of the game. He hoped that having multiple versions would allow everyone to feel like they had something unique despite it being the same game, and that aligned with Tajiri's goal of bringing people together. When Pokemon was released in Japan, it was met with okay sales. Many thought that the game would not do well since it was released near the end of the Game Boy's life cycle. By the end of its first week, it managed to sell around 250,000 copies. Quoting Ishihara, I remember looking at the weekly sales figures and feeling that we were just hovering around the edges of the top 10. Despite the slow start, Pokemon's popularity absolutely exploded, most likely due to the word of mouth and Korokoro magazine. Oh, and did I forget to mention the secret 151st Pokemon? A little bugger known as Mew. You might be saying, wait. Weren't there only 150 Pokemon? Well, you'd be right, there were only 150 Pokemon, until a cheeky programmer by the name of Shigeki Morimoto decided to add in Mew. The devs were instructed to not touch the code after debugging was complete. At this stage of the game's development, they had no memory left for any new Pokemon, so Morimoto removed their debug tools and inserted Mew in its place. Well, after debugging, of course and it was probably thanks to Morimoto's handiwork that Pokemon exploded the way it did. Due to an unintentional bug in the game's code, some people were able to encounter and obtain Mew. Just imagine, an elusive 151st Pokemon that was so rare it wasn't even counted by the game. As a kid, you'd be pretty determined to be the first person to catch the mythical Pokemon. Word spread quickly of this mythical Pokemon, and soon, the Pokemon games were flying off the shelves. Anyway, let's talk about the game itself. The game starts with you talking to Professor Oak who gives you a brief exposition on the world of Pokemon. You then get to choose your name and remind Oak of the name of his own grandson. And then you are transported to your room. After you go outside, you are quickly stopped by Oak again who brings you to his lab. Here you are given the choice to pick one of three Pokemon to take with you. Charmander, Squirtle or Bulbasaur. After you complete a small errand for Oak, he then gives you and your rival a Pokedex and then your adventure begins. The main plot of the game sees you travelling across Kanto to collect 8 gym badges and then ultimately challenging the Elite Four and the Champion. However, not everything is rainbows and sunshine in Kanto, as an evil organisation known as Team Rocket have been causing trouble. From stealing to exploiting Pokemon, I definitely found this to be the most interesting part of the plot, 
especially when you find out that their leader is Giovanni, the final gym leader. Unfortunately, the rest of the plot doesn't really hold up as well, and this was likely intentional. According to Ishihara, in an interview he said, For Pokemon, even though it basically uses RPG gameplay, what we're aiming for is not to tell a story but to enjoy trading and battling through a communicator. The devs wanted the game to be unclosed, meaning that even after the player finished the game, they had something to do, and that something was to complete the Pokedex. And this was really to emphasize player interaction. The game itself played like a traditional RPG at the time. It comprised of an overworld where you could interact with NPCs and have random encounters in designated areas such as tall grass and caves. Uh, random encounters, my least favorite RPG mechanic. I mean, it's not bad per se, it's just annoying. Like, all I want to do is heal my Pokemon, why are there so many Zubats in this cave? Uh, anyway. The other side of the gameplay was the turn-based combat, and this is where things get a little more interesting. Each one has a type that is strong against another, but weak to the other type. For example, Charmander is fire, Squirtle is water, and Bulbasaur is grass type. It doesn't take much to work out how they interact, but I'll explain it anyway. Fire is weak to water and strong against grass. Water is weak to grass, but strong against fire. And grass is weak to fire and strong against water. This simple rock-scissors-paper interaction was added because the devs thought that having strong and weak Pokemon would make the game tedious. And I have to say, as simple as it is, it adds a lot of needed depth to the combat. With 15 different types and many Pokemon having dual types and being able to use moves of different types, it made for engaging battles that kept you on your toes at all times. Quoting composer Junichi Masuda, the person responsible for the iconic Pokemon tunes we all know and love today, one of the base concepts of Pokemon is to really make it playable for anyone. I really think this direction was the right one as it allowed a competitive scene to develop in later iterations. I mean, can you imagine Pokemon with action commands? At one point, the devs played around with the battle mechanics so that the text would display that hurt or that really hurt when Pokemon were attacked, but they found the HP gauges more intuitive. Although I wouldn't be surprised if that's how the iconic phrase, it's super effective, came into existence. In terms of the music, I found the chip tune to be charming and strangely infectious. It isn't hard to see why the chipper tunes and classic themes from the first game are so iconic. My hat's off to you, Masuda. Okay, so that ends part 1 of the retrospective. In the next part, I'll be covering gold and silver, and in part 3, I'll cover heart gold and soul silver. I'll see you then.